and welcome everybody um, to this our uh, uh, Diamond Ambassador event, the, the last one of the year. And um, this is unfortunately it's online because we would have loved to be feeding you all at this moment in some sort of strange socially distanced mechanism. Um, and Anthony, you are welcome to come to any of our Diamond Ambassadors at uh, events at any time. We will feed you and not put you in hot seats because it's very, very gracious of you to, to find the time to be here today. And also I appreciate this is an absolutely horrific moment to be an MP in the middle of a group of businesses because you, you are the focal point of all of their attention around some really hefty issues. But I know that the, the Diamond Ambassadors who are attending today are our friends and our colleagues, so they will hopefully treat you in the, the way as we would expect in terms of you are our, our conduit to send messages to government and our campaigner on our behalf. So we need to make sure we're treating you like that as opposed to the focal point of, of grief. Um, but it is a most difficult moment, obviously, to be to be a business uh, and well, a human being, but all, from our point of view, a business in terms of COVID, in terms of Brexit, uh, in terms of, of absolutely everything that they're being hit with. Um, I do want to make sure we're getting um, uh, a balanced look at not only what should we be doing in terms of the, 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 the really hefty problems we're facing now, but also some of the things we've been hearing about in terms of the spending review going forward and how do we best spin all of those things from infrastructure strategies and, and infrastructure banks, et cetera, and changes to the green book so we can really get advantages into our, our local area as well. So the whole thing of how do we move forward in a positive way too. And so obviously we want to give you the chance to start off to, to um, give us your thoughts on, on anything you want around the, the whole variety of topics we're dealing with at the moment. And then we do have some questions that have come in already. And then we'll just, as, as Simon says, we will we will try to take them to the floor. I just have to say that these um, the opinions voiced today are, are those of the, the people around the table and do not rep uh, um, represent the official uh, feedback of the opinions of the chamber on, on the topics concerned. Although you all know me and I would have said the same thing, whichever one we were in anyway. But over to Anthony, and uh, thank you for being here. Thanks very much, uh, Miranda and Simon. Uh, I guess starting by saying thanks very much for inviting me. When I got elected, it, it's a week on Saturday that I took over as the MP for Burnley. Uh, and I'm not sure if this is the year I thought it would be. Uh, I knew we'd have some prickly moments with Brexit, but um, I, I didn't anticipate a global pandemic filling up my inbox. And the hope when I first got elected was that I could go around and see uh, all the main businesses in Burnley across the first six, seven months, and then start start working my way around. But uh, unfortunately, most of that hasn't been possible. So, um, you know, I do hope over the next 12 months, because there is light on the horizon now, that I can come and, uh, and, and see you all in person. Uh, and I'll definitely take up your offer of being fed and watered uh, at the next Platinum event, uh, whenever that is. I guess just, I'll, I'll kick off with some observations of where we've got to over the last 12 months, what uh, what was on my agenda and then uh, and then where it is now. Uh, I mean, unsurprisingly, uh, the main thing on my agenda and, and it remains firmly on my agenda is uh, bringing government focus to Burnley, to Paddyham, uh, to all of East Lancashire, really, because that's, you know, it's what's been missing for a very long time. You know, I don't think we've had the uh, the focus that actually we do get now. So, you know, I, I can walk into a meeting with uh, the Chancellor uh, or Number 10 last week, uh, albeit virtually, uh, you don't walk into many meetings anymore, do you? Um, but you can walk in there and, and there is a genuine desire to engage, to discuss uh, and to understand the issues. Um, everyone will hopefully have seen the levelling up fund that the Chancellor announced back at the spending review. So I say a little bit about that, uh, because that is kind of the culmination of, uh, of what we wanted to kick off back in the, uh, the early days of 2020, when the Chancellor was setting out his first budget and then had to quite quickly, um, quite quickly chop and change. So that, I mean, that fund really, it's £4 billion uh, over the next couple of years. And that's it's got a very specific aim of delivering results very quickly. So the idea isn't that this fund goes into things that will be delivered over the next 10 to 15 years. 
because actually I think what, what you do when you do that is you lose focus. You lose focus from government, from councils, um, and, and actually most businesses are looking, you know, when you look at investment, you look at the next five-ish years, what can we do that in five years' time will transform the business? Uh, and that's where government needs to get to. So the levelling up fund is kind of intended for that. So that's why there's a, you know, anything, that, any money that comes out of that has to be spent and project delivered by 2024. And actually that offers some really exciting um, potentials for, for us across East Lancashire because there is no shortage of things we can, uh, we can dip in and apply for. Uh, and that can be anything from, you know, a, a, I want to say a couple of hundred thousand pounds. I think that's at the lower end of what the Chancellor was thinking, although it's still a huge sum of money. Um, but it goes all the way up to, you know, 20 million pounds, which would totally transform, um, you know, from my perspective, parts of Burnley and, I'm always pleased when I see Karen on the on a on a call because uh, me and Karen have great conversations about what we can do to um, to really level up Burnley. And um, I've got such a fantastic relationship with Karen actually because Burnley College is central to to what I think we need to do um, across Burnley, Paddy, and but also across East Lancashire. You know, I think Burnley College really is a beacon for young people. Um, but Karen's battling with unprecedented demand for places so if we're going to keep that world-class uh, education locally we need to invest in it so that's what the leveling up fund is about and um, there's also some other things some of which I'm speaking to some private businesses about some of which you know government can tap into you know things like digital broad but gigabit broadband things that you know far too many people uh, email into me who live in Burnley which you would think is a reasonably well connected part of the world to say they've got mo no mobile phone signal and no broadband well, you can't really run anything. Uh, you can't run a business. You can barely run your life without a mobile phone signal or broadband. So some of those things are just, you know, they, they're going to be the quick wins that we try and uh, try and get out there. Um, and then if I say a little bit on Brexit, because I know that's kind of top of mind for, for some people, particularly on manufacturing businesses. Uh, I think we've all been saying for probably about two and a half months now that we're in, we're in the final stages of negotiations and something will happen in the next week but I you know something will happen in the next week so uh, the Prime Minister spoke to the Commission President over the weekend our negotiating team went to Brussels uh, and they're there at the minute and then the PM uh, and the Commission President will speak again later this afternoon um, to stop taking and, and find out whether there is actually an agreement uh, to be had. I think there is um, I sit on the future relationship with the EU committee, so I've um, had the opportunity to speak to Michel Barnier directly, uh, along with uh, Lord Frost, our own negotiator, uh, and Michael Gove quite a few times. And there is definitely a desire there to get a deal on both sides. Um, but I mean, the, the stumbling blocks are, are well run in the press. I think most people can see what they are. Fishing is the one that comes up the most, and you always get this um, this perplexed look from people when we say fishing is a stumbling block because it's not a huge sector of the economy. Um, but politically, for the EU, uh, just as much as us, it is a very sensitive issue um, because as soon as you remove it, you know, it, it would have the same impact on some of those communities that um, shutting down coal mines had, for example. It, it really does transform a community, either it really helps it or, or really harms it. And so that's why it's so politically contentious. But we seem to have, we seem to be finding some kind of um, way forward on that state aid or level playing field, however what you want to describe it, is the next big stumbling block. Um, that seems to be the harder one of the two. That's been the one that um, you know, it, going back all the way to kind of April time, is the one that's been so problematic. Um, the UK position has, has broadly been, you know, we absolutely want. Uh, a fair competition regime. If you judge us on our history, we have historically um, used state aid far less than any other um, comparable European country. I put that to Michel Barnier uh, directly and the European position is, well, we're looking forwards, not backwards. So actually what you've done in the past is irrelevant. We're interested in the future. And I'm not sure that entirely holds, uh, stands up to argument. Um, but I do think there is a, a landing zone in sight. Uh, it will come down to the politics of it and whether the uh, heads of state on their side and uh, in some ways we're lucky that we've only got one uh, head of government that we need to convince and that's the PM. 
they've got 27 of them all with competing interests and you know we'll see over the next two or three days whether that becomes possible um you know there'll be a statement coming out from downing street later today about what the conversation has been between the uk and the eu and then the final um council meeting of all the heads of government is on thursday this week um, and we really are pushing it on timelines once we get to that date because once the, the real complexity uh, we can get it through the uk parliament reasonably quickly the complexity on the eu side is whatever we do whatever agreement we reach has to be translated into 24 languages uh, and that's got to be legally binding so it can't be an informal translation it's got to be a full uh, legal text translation that can then be considered nationally and, and put through their own uh, parliaments or assemblies so that's probably all i'll say on brexit unless there's any specific questions and then just on covid uh, because i know that's that's probably the main issue of the year uh, and going into next year i certainly don't underestimate how tough it's been you know i i try and speak to as many businesses as i can across uh, most weeks just to try and understand the impact and every time i go into uh, a zoom meeting or or knocking on the door of number 11 on number 10 it is top of list here's the impact on uh, local businesses here's what we need to get through it um, and you know that extends to conversations with the health secretary as well uh, the latest tier system uh, I'll, I'll be honest i was not happy with us going into tier three uh, I, you know you'll find very few uh, mps that were uh, sadly we get no say over what tier we go into we can lobby and make representations but the main representation always comes from the director of public health and understandably so they're the the health expert on the ground but you know me and and, and other colleagues who know that many of you will know always go uh, to bat to try and make sure there's a balance you know you can't just take this as a public health crisis as serious as it is there is an economic uh, impact to everything we do uh, and the chancellor to be fair is always very willing to listen listen um, sometimes he struggles uh, for various reasons to to do all of the things we ask for, um, but you know, 80, 90 percent of the time he's really willing to try and find a way forward. And I think he's uh, he's done a, a reasonably good job. Although I I know that some people will have slipped through the net or uh, or the support's not been quite what's been required. Um, but hope is on the horizon. You know the the vaccine news from last week was. Uh, was it last week or the week before whenever it was it was i think you know if anyone saw matt hancock on the news on the day it came out he was beaming uh, and 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 he's been like that ever since on the calls i've been on you know he, he, when the pandemic hit in march you know we were in the the doldrums frankly and you know i think we can all probably remember what we were thinking about back then and then as we went through the summer I remember all the news outlets and lots of people I spoke to saying, well, there might be a vaccine, but you can't guarantee it. And so we've got to learn to live with COVID. And, uh, and, and it was a pretty, pretty depressing, um, depressing mood to be in. Uh, and, you know, the, the, the sad truth is you can't live with COVID. You know, far too many people die with COVID. Um, and, you know, despite the 99.5%, I think is the figure that goes out there about how, how deadly it is, it's not the case, right? We've done an amazing job of stopping people getting it, which is why so few people, uh, albeit a lot, are, um, are sadly losing their life. Um, but the vaccines are starting tomorrow. That's the Pfizer one. Um, the main one that we need to get out there is the AstraZeneca Oxford one. Uh, and I think that's still going through uh, its approval. It will only be approved if it's safe. Uh, so I say all of this with a kind of a hope that it gets approved rather than any uh, any knowledge I have. but. Um, if it is safe, and the indications are that it is, then that can go out there and there are uh, far more of those vials sitting in storage waiting to get distributed across the country than we have of the, the Pfizer-BioNTech one. So, um, you know, I think the Secretary of State for Health picked his words very carefully when he said by Easter we'll be back to some kind of normality. You know, we've not heard that kind of language throughout the crisis so far, and I don't think he would have said it, or in fact he's told me he wouldn't say it unless he had a degree of confidence and then we've seen some other news um, over the last couple of days where there's been an indication that March actually might be a time we can um, start to see things back to normal so you know it's there's definitely still a, a rough couple of months ahead um, 
but all our numbers locally, if we look at this purely locally, our numbers are going in absolutely the right direction. They have been doing since end of October, really. Um, we've been in a, a reasonably good place falling down, but they've been coming down from such a high number. We just, you know, when I went lobbying the Secretary of State for Health to try and get in tier two, he said, your numbers are starting from such a high place. It doesn't matter how uh, quickly you come down, you've just got that little bit further to go. Uh, and Liverpool's were coming down before ours were coming down. So um, I am lobbying as, as hard as I possibly can for the 16th of December. Um, and all the indications are looking right, but uh, I, I'd love to say I can make a promise uh, that we'll get into tier two for the 16th, 17th, 18th of December. Uh, I can't, but if we if we stick on our current trajectory, uh, all do our bit, then you know I think we've got a, a reasonably good, good case to make. Uh, and I'll be making that case to the public health director as well, because uh, he seems, uh, you know, his. People would have seen the Lancashire FA decision over the weekend, right, where grassroots sport has ended uh, in Lancashire. Again, I think it's the wrong decision, um, but it shows where the directors of public health are thinking. And so there's that, you know, that huge tension between uh, MPs and, and others who are trying to balance the economics with the health uh, and your public health officials who are looking purely at the, the health data. So um, it's, a, it's a constant tension, a healthy tension, you, know, you do need it, but um, hopefully that helps at giving some some insight, if you like, into uh, some of those tricky balances and where we're at. But I've probably spoken for far too long, sorry. No, it's fine. Thank you very much. And you've, you've surfed across a lot of topics and, and, and also given us your, your, you know, your personal point of view, which is important in terms of where you're placed for us and what you're, what you're already trying to communicate. You know, that's really important to know. I think we've, we've seen the same kind of whole range of things we've seen obviously huge COVID impact starting with the hospitality tourism and leisure sector and I will come straight to Keely in a moment um you know and the the impact there which is visible for all but to see but but just absolutely huge and then um other concerning areas of impact like into to civil aerospace um, and then trying to push on the whole infrastructure investment to provide a diversification route for that sector. And then worrying about the fact that the, the sectors of our, our, our economy that have managed to keep on going are our manufacturing sectors. And they're the ones that are most likely to be taken out by Brexit uncertainty because they can't put price lists out. Um, having to fight about that state aid piece, which actually is really important in terms of future support from government to places like Tata Steel and things like that, deals that we, we have been hamstrung and not been able to do to support key businesses. And it's a major loss for Brexit if we don't get that independence and be, you know that ability to support our own business sectors. Um, and then into the future stuff and, and the green book and the changes there and how that might improve uh, as having a level playing field in, in the north uh, as well as the south to go get that government investment into the area um, and how much sway we can put on the, the infrastructure bank being bla placed in the north somewhere. And, and can we have it in East Lancashire? Because that would be great. I'd love to have it in East Lancashire. <laughs> but yeah, so it's, it, is a, it is a huge range of topics at the moment. I want to start with um, an amalgamated question, which is one that we've had from several sources, which is about the tiers um structure um and we understand what you're saying about about wanting to um obviously get us as as, as as soon as possible into a lower tier do you think they will this is sort of pushing together a bit of heidi and a bit of key do you think that they will go for a more nuanced local approach to lancashire um with the tiers and can we please make sure that we have as much warning as possible because we cannot set a hotel back up within three days we've, we've got to have as much morning as possible to be able to cope with that yeah the, the notice point is a really difficult one because uh, and I've, I've found myself arguing both sides of that with the the secretary of state over the summer where you want as much notice as possible but you also don't want to delay an opening um before and so i mean i think the timeline this time around will be the review date is the 16th of december so that's when uh, all the data will uh, be fed in, uh, the public health directors will have their say, um, all comes together. 17th is the final decision day. 
So that's when the PM will sit down with um, Gold Command, as it's known, uh, which includes like the Secretary of State and, and uh, Chief Medical Officer and all of that, and announce any change. And then the 18th is when it would kick in. Um, so, it, I mean, it, you're right, it doesn't leave a, a lot of time, but um, hopefully it allows those places that can start to reopen, you know, the restaurants um, to start doing so. Um, as for how localised we can make it, it, again, it's a really tough one um, because, you know, if we take Lancashire as a block, there are some parts of Lancashire that are really low from an infection rate point of view. Uh, and other parts, you know, East Lancashire is, is typically or has been uh, a little bit higher. And so actually, if you take a whole county approach, then uh, then our numbers sometimes look um, slightly better. Although if you take us just on our own, they're coming down much more rapidly. Um, they have promised to look more um, geographically defined if they can do. And there are other parts of the country where they have managed to do it. Um, I do, I think Slough is the example of Slough's actually in tier three, whereas um, all the areas around it are in tier three. What they seem to be looking at is where people are flowing from and to, um, both in terms of work and, and living. So East Lancashire, you could probably take as a reasonably self-contained um, unit or geographical area, because most people tend to live and work in East Lancashire. You'll get people going into uh, other parts or going into Manchester or places like that, but. Um, so they are willing to look at it, but they need the the strong case of actually this is why this is where the people flows are, um, and and I, you know, yeah, I think I can say this. Uh, I wouldn't want to push that case unless I thought it would be helpful to us. You know, I wouldn't want to push that case if I thought actually it might result in a, a different outcome. And I know when and the Lancashire Resilience Forum made its first recommendations before we went into this new tier system. They did do the split, so they treated East Lancashire slightly differently to the rest of the county. Um, I guess we'll see over the next few days what the data looks like at a county-wide basis and individual boroughs and, um, and see whether there's a trend. I mean, you could see a clear trend if you looked at the map um, early on and then started extrapolating. You saw it spread across East Lancashire, which would give some indication that actually everything is broadly self-contained. Thank you very much. So Keely, did you want to tell us specifically about the, the example of the fence gate and where you feel that the, the support just hasn't been right to, 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 to support your industry and your business? Yes, morning everybody. Um, morning Anthony, thank you for taking our questions this morning. Um, I run hospitality businesses in Pendle and the Ribble Valley. Um, I'm just looking for some information on, on what support uh, is there for tier three businesses during this period of forced closure in December? Yeah, uh, great question. So you've got, so you, you, you're still definitely entitled to the closure grant. So that's the one that's based on rateable value. I suspect you're probably at the higher end of rateable values if it's the fence gate. Yes. Uh, yeah, yeah, so you'll be at the higher end of the rateable value. So you've got your closure grant. Now, if we're successful and we manage to go into tier two on 18th of December, there is still a grant available. Um, it's not the closure grant, it's the, um, it's called COVID restrictions open grant, if you like. So it's the one that's applicable to any hospitality business uh, that is allowed to open but subject to the restrictions which basically mean your trade is impacted nonetheless. Um, it, it's a direct reflection of over the summer uh, and we saw this in Burnley you know eat out to help out was great apart from you couldn't have household mixing inside and so actually the utility of eat out to help out was limited uh, across most of East Lancashire compared to other parts of the country. Uh, and so lots of us went to the chancer and said, you know, if, it doesn't matter whether you're uh, a pub or a restaurant, if you can't have two families sat at a table, um, suddenly you might have 40 tables that would have normally sat 60 households. Now you've got 40 tables and it's 40 households. That's a, a huge impact on uh, on your trade. And so he did, uh, he did extend it. Um, so you should be able to get, uh, at the minute, the closure one, but if in a week and a half's time or 10 days time, we switch um, the open one. And that open one also, uh, uh, you, you may well have got this already, but it can be backdated 
to August. So what the hospitality businesses that, as I said, suffered during ETA to help out should still be able to get the open but with restrictions grant for August, um, I suspect August, September and October before the closure then kicked in. Yeah. I think we're waiting to hear from Pendle Council on, on that particular grant, but the forced closure grant for November, which was £3,000 for our rateable value, didn't even cover the employer's NI and pension contributions that are now currently required by the furlough scheme. So Fencegate with a huge rateable value, way in excess of £150,000, we're one of the, the highest rate payers in Pendle, for 21 weeks, forced closure now, we have received a grand total of £3,000. Yeah, no, I, I mean, that's not enough. Right? Whereas yeah. businesses on the high street, some smaller retail businesses have received, you know, the initial £25,000 that was offered over the lockdown one. Yeah. which we weren't eligible for because that was capped at a rateable value of £51,000. But I just can't see how the Chancellor thinks that that was fair. Yeah, no, it, I mean, you're right. Um, and that's why the, the new grants don't have that same cap on them um, because so many missed out and, you know, you're still closed. You know, the idea was that was a time-limited thing and you'd have been open and trading and, and making everything back. Um, that 3,000 should in, increase based on the open grant that we just um, spoke about. Um, if you struggle, though, um, uh, I would say let me know, but it's probably not me, is it? It's Andrew. Um, I'm written to Andrew. I'm yet oh. to receive a response from him. Oh, right. Okay. Yeah. I'll, um, I'll let him know. Um, Thank you. <laughs> I mean, it's exactly the kind of thing that I ask all businesses to do with me. Right? If anyone applies for any of these grants and doesn't hear back within a a reasonable period of time and um, get in touch with me because uh, I have no hesitation on going and knocking on the council's door because from my point of view the government's given the money you know the, the money's been there for over a month now and that was supposed to just be a conduit right the the recipient of the money is all of you and everyone else in the sector and we can't hold it up for um, reasons of you know bureaucracy if, if we can call it that you know it needs to get to where it uh, where it needs to get to on the NI point of view, uh, NI and uh, pensions and all that, I totally get it. Um, it. It is something that I've spoken to the Chancellor about. Um, I'll keep making the case. I know it's it, it's tough. Yeah, I think in the industry we're known as the forgotten 51k. Um, I'm sure Heidi feels exactly the same from James's places. Um, you know, we are some of the the highest paying, you know, business rates. Um, in the area and we've received the least i mean three thousand pounds for 21 weeks forced closure is just not acceptable you've no. been caught in a particular gap haven't you because um yes. you think of the original ten thousand and twenty five thousand uh, pound grants they were there to catch small businesses and limiting it by rateable property size they were trying to limit size of business turnover yeah. and, and number of staff but of course, if you're looking at a hotel, you've got a far larger premise, still a small business in terms of staff and in terms of, of turnover, but your premises size, therefore your rateable value, just puts you completely out of whack. So maybe maybe we could try and influence about the fact that that, that boundary needs moving now. It isn't, it isn't the rateable value, it's a different way of assessing it because the whole of our substantial property sector in yeah. terms of hotels and, and and restaurants in that way are being completely excluded on a, a repeated basis, aren't they? Yeah, you, you, you're absolutely right. It's the logic behind using rateable value was was sound in that it was the easiest way to get money out of the door quite quickly because councils had access to all the information. You know, there's a, a, a literal register of every property's rateable value. It's easy to check. It goes out the door quite quickly. Uh, it allowed. I, mean, I know some councils. I think it was Hindburn literally just sent the checks out out the door to all the properties they had the list of. Um, Burnley did it in, in a slightly different way, but it was easy and it was quick and it made sure that the money got out the door. But you're right, Keely, you and um, and others have, have definitely missed out on that. Hopefully some of the other things have, have proven helpful. I know not necessarily to the same magnitude 
um, like the business rates or the C bills or stuff like that. But um, I will keep keep pushing the cause because, um, you, as you saw with Eat Out to help out, the government genuinely does understand the um, the the impact hospitality has on the country. You know, it's, it it is absolutely the the sector that we're trying to find a way of supporting, and I think we're we're going to have to find another eat out to help out or eat out to help out mark two once we've got the certainty that confidence can come back and be sustained you know th because that's the that's what we need you know early-ish next year once we're on that proper trajectory to recovery get the confidence back and sustain it back um i don't want to hog um the talks now I'll just make one last comment um 750 pounds a week in december in our busiest trading period is just not enough support from the government um you know we're, we're only going to get back to trading on the 18th 19th of december and the 750 pounds a week is is just not enough like we say it doesn't even cover our rni and, and pension contributions oh, yeah. why is the welsh government giving out almost six times that amount if i had this business in wales i'd be receiving seventeen thousand pounds for six weeks forced closure so i think the main so i did look into the welsh uh, thing once they made the announcement and uh, as you probably expect when uh, haranguing the treasury the main difference seems to be that the well whereas the uk um or the 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 UK scheme, English scheme, whatever you want to call it, is on a rolling basis. So it's uncapped in the in in England, uh, but it's done on a monthly by monthly basis. Whereas the the Welsh one is a a block payment that then ends uh, and there's nothing nothing beyond it. That seems to be the main difference. But if if you compare the the levels um, on a time period, they do look broadly similar. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much, um, Katie, for all your comments. Um, I think I think we should we should be pushing back about that that rateable value, missing the point of the, the hospitality sector. Because so I'll give you a call about that as well. But thank you very much. I appreciate both yours and, and, and Heidi's position on this. Um, can I move on to Karen Buchanan, please? Karen, you made a, a very nice comment about. Um, support for, for Burnley College and you've also got a, a question as well. Yeah, just uh, Anthony's been great for the college. He's come in and spoken to students about politics. He's uh, he's also helped us access funds that we wouldn't have been able to access before and we didn't even know about them. So he has been really supportive of the local college. But my question really was, um, uh, uh, Pendle man Nelson managed to get a Towns Fund um, and I was hopeful that we might have another Towns Fund opportunity popping up, but I wondered with the money that's being used to help support furloughed workers and that, whether that, might, that opportunity might disappear. I think it would be useful for Burnley to be able to have some kind of money to, to make. With us, we're, we're developing a campus. Edge Hill University was, is fantastic if, ever, if you've ever been. And they had a long-term vision and they built it bit by bit. Our, our campus includes Burnley Town Centre and we would love, you know, for, for things, an area around the town to have a vision and perhaps be able to use the town's fund to, to, to buy into that. So it was about whether that will continue or not. And if you have any opportunity to bid. Yes, great question. Um, so it's not gone away. Uh, the, the town's fund or town's deal uh, is definitely still there. So this is probably one of the things I've raised in the chamber more than anything else. Um, and the, the Secretary of State for Communities and Local Government knows me all too well now. Um, and he knows I'm, <laughs> I'm knocking at the door every opportunity to get uh, a Towns Fund. So it's come in. The last update I had was uh, January, February next year was when they were looking to open the next round of competitive bidding. Um, and I um, uh, will continue to knock at the door uh, before them. But you're right. I mean, the, the benefit of a Towns Fund is it brings all the key stakeholders together. Um, you know, it's not just the council looking at what infrastructure it thinks is needed or uh, me thinking about it or, or any one stakeholder. It, it establishes a clear board that brings local businesses, you know, the college, me, everyone who's got a vested interest in um, developing a, a proper strategic plan for where Burnley needs to get to. Uh, it brings everyone together, 
you can design it and develop it and then you put your bid into government to say we've done it here's what it looks like here's the economic impact it'll have here's the um, leveling up of opportunity for our young people it'll have or our um, long-term unemployed you know all those people and here's the money we need to to get it done um, and that's exactly the kind of thing that um, the leveling up fund which is bringing all these things together is designed to do it's designed to make sure that there's one coherent voice and and government pot of money to say tell us what it is you need to do all of those things to make sure that we're you know we're punching above our way um, so yes uh, it is definitely coming again uh, and watch this space thank you okay good thank you very much um karen morris you've got a a, a question about digital exclusion uh, good afternoon thank you very much um hello anthony um I'm the Development Director for Community Foundation for Lancashire. Um, we've been managing the um, emergency funds uh, since March into Lancashire and um, uh, working with National Emergency Trust, great support from businesses across Lancashire and, and individuals and, and brought about £2 million into the county um, to support um, small groups. There's a number of key themes have, that have come out of that. Um, and one that I wanted to touch on today um, is about digital exclusion. So you mentioned in the levelling up about access to broadband and, and mobile yeah. signal. Um, something that's come out loud and clear that we were already having discussions about but really come through um, the pandemic is a digital exclusion. So at both ends of the spectrum. So you've got young people who are trying to gather around one mobile phone to do homework and homeschooling. Um, you've got families making choices between do I buy food, do I heat the house, or do I pay for broadband? Um, so while it, we welcome and do welcome anything that, that helps bring access to homes and businesses, I'm just wondering if there's any thoughts in terms of with the levelling up, some people are in a lower position even to be able to access that once the, the broadband and the mobile signals are, are improved across um, Burnley and, and the county even wider. Yeah, I think it's a really important point, Karen, and you know, if, if COVID has taught us one thing, it's how important digital connectivity is, right? It, you know, it, didn't, it doesn't matter whether you were a, a secondary school pupil, um, you needed to be able to study from home. If you, you were sent home from the office, you had to work from home on your right. You can't, you know, if, if you're struggling to pay the bills, then broadband it's just a utility now, you know, it's, it's in the same category as water and electric and, and one of the really odd things is the way VAT is charged on broadband and not the utilities, right? I mean, that in itself is an extra price that we're asking people to pay for something that we now all recognize is just an essential item. So there is a, a bit of a campaign to remove that because that will lower the price a little bit. Um, I'm also speaking, as I said, just in the intro a bit to a, a, a few companies about how we can bring cheaper uh, broadband to, to Burnley uh, in particular, because that's what we really need to do. You know, the big problem with broadband is it's generally a one company system, uh, or the, the wholesale bit is, and so the price is the price. Uh, you can normally find something more expensive than the price, but you'll rarely find anything cheaper. Um, but there are a couple of companies that I'm speaking to that might be able to do something a bit cheaper, which I think actually for us is the most important thing, because as you point out, quite a, a, a cohort of people uh, in Burnley and this definitely extends across all of East Lancashire if not the county just can't meet that current base cost mm. you know they need something you know far cheaper uh, if not getting close to free um, so it's definitely there um, uh, uh, when we sent all the schools home you'll have seen that we uh, or the government issued laptops or tablets um, around the country and that you know really importantly had to come with a, a dongle uh, I think is what they're called you know like a 3G or 4G um, connection to it. I've seen some things in the news about how some of those have been taken away they've not what they've done is redistribute them so that every school's got about 10% coverage because you the stats show about 10% of the students are at home at any one time and that means they've got the laptops for it so it's more about making sure that everyone can can cover it but I think that you know there is going to be an important conversation that we have about what role schools and um, I don't want to say colleges because Karen might glare at me but what role educational establishments have in making sure that students have the right connectivity and um, because if you're asking someone to work from home 
or study from home, you know, where does that obligation start and end of making sure that they can actually do it? Because what you don't want is a child saying, yeah, okay, I'll do that at home. And out of embarrassment, not being able to say actually, but I can't do it. Uh, you know, we've got to find a way of bridging that gap. So um, I know it's something that the DFE are actively looking at. Um, I'm trying to sort out the the local infrastructure problems that mean people just can't access it. And hopefully those two things eventually come together. And that's to say nothing of rural connectivity, which is a, a totally separate, albeit quite a sizable problem still. You know, there are still, as I said, still parts of Burnley um, that are just without anything. Uh, you know, no mobile phone signal. Uh, one person uh, emailed me uh, and had to drive to send the email to me. Um, you know, about three miles, which is <clears throat> just bizarre. I mean, that means you can't sit at home and do your mobile banking. You can't sit at home and uh, all the things we take for granted. And I think most of us do take it for granted, um, but it's still a, a huge issue. So I know there's some government funds there, but what we, you know, just as I said with the levelling up fund, the money being there doesn't actually do anything unless you use it quite quickly. Uh, and you need to see quite quick results. You know, I think we need to get away from this idea that we can announce a 10 year fund to improve broadband connectivity. What we need is a 12 month fund to improve broadband connectivity. You know, and you, it's what businesses do. You put the money in, you invest, and then you adapt and you learn and you go and do something else rather than saying, yeah, let's spend five billion pounds laying new wire across the country. Um, let's find another way of doing it, you know, a quicker way of doing it. And there's definitely some technology out there that looks possible. Um, and you'll have seen the government investing in um, satellites uh, that generated a whole host of headlines for, I think the wrong reason, um, everyone associated with Brexit, you know, actually satellites are a really easy way of delivering broadband quite cheaply to really rural parts of the world, uh, including in our own country. Hopefully that kind of answers the question. Thank you. And um, linking, linking two previous questions together, um, this is actually what some of the, the town deal funds are being earmarked for in a couple of the areas where I'm involved with them is, is looking at widespread high quality broadband yeah. for those areas. So that, that's, a, that's a possibility there. Um, I can speak on behalf of certain areas of, of Burnley that have no signal. My son, who's, who's just been made redundant, has, has had to get in his car to drive to find a signal to talk to his universal credit person. Because if they miss the phone calls, it, it, it doesn't work. You know, so they're absolutely insane in this day and age to have to do that. Um, uh, welcome to, to Richard and, and Tony, who have joined us. Please do um, either put your hand up if you've got a question or put it into chat and I'll call on you to ask it. Um, I'm nearly at the end of the ones I've had already, so so field me some more. Um, next, I'd like to call on Mike Lane, who's got a question around the, the 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 balance of government support and where the emphasis should be, and especially mentioned entrepreneurial taxation as well. Yeah, um, uh, reading in the paper, the uh, government seem or the treasury seem prone to want to increase. Uh, taxation on entrepreneurs. Uh, there was already the slashing of the entrepreneurs allowance uh, in the last budget and it seems now that uh, they want to uh, uh, increase capital gains tax um, uh, and also possibly uh, not fulfill the uh, previous obligation to reduce corporation tax and uh, I guess my question is uh, around this, that you know, uh, cash uh, is the, the, the dual fuel of small businesses and entrepreneurs. Um, you, know, you need cash to expand your business. And if 40% of what you make is going to be taken away by the government, uh, that's, that's you know, cash out of the business, but also it's, uh, uh, the, the motivation to uh, invest, to grow, to progress, and all the rest of it is uh, really taken away. If 40% of all, all your efforts, you put your house on the line, you put your pension on the line, you put all sorts on the line, and you, you've got an eventual objective to uh, sell your business or whatever uh, when you retire, 
uh, and then government comes along and takes 40% of it away. Um, you know, what's, what's the thinking going on here? Because I see the only way out of the trouble this country is in is, is growth, grow our way out. And the growth is not going to come from the big corporations. The growth is going to come from the small businesses. And you're taking away our motivation and our cash. Yeah, I think you're absolutely right, Mike, about where the growth will come from. Um, there is often a focus on the on the big corporations because uh, they have the largest voice. But actually, if you look at where economic growth comes from, you know, a, a large corporate might grow by one, two percent a year. An SME can easily grow by double digits every year. Um, I would always take some of what's in the paper with a pinch of salt. I I say that more now, having been on the receiving end of some of what's in the papers, and you look at it with quite a perplexed look, not quite sure where it's come from. So some of it I would take with a pinch of salt. Um, I mean, I don't relish the job of the Chancellor at the minute. Uh, you know, he's got a very difficult balance to try and strike in um, in making sure that the money we've got goes to the right place and, and, and making sure that we've got the right money. Um, if it gives you any uh, comfort, all of the conversations I've had with him and with the PM have focused on how we kickstart the economy as we come out of this. Um, and, you know, corporation tax, I think we've already said, won't drop. There was a, it was on a, a tapered down. Uh, the level it's at now is the level it, level it will stop at, at least for, um, at least for a little while. Um, just because, you know, with economic circumstances being where they are, I think we're already within the competitive banding for the G7. It just means we won't get to the bottom of, of that list. Um, entrepreneurial uh, tax relief is something that I've spoken to the Chancellor about, and I know lots of other colleagues are doing exactly the same thing for exactly the reason you highlight, um, that actually people who build up a business and then uh, come to retire, and if you're retiring, you're probably going to sell it on because... What we don't want is people to think that the best thing to do is just to close it down when you've built up quite a successful company. So um, I can't say anything that means none of that will happen, but um, the Treasury is receiving the message uh, loud and clear that SMEs, uh, new businesses that are starting up and growing, are the only way we'll get out of it. And so whilst there are some difficult choices to make, uh, we've got to make sure that as we make them, we don't harm the very people who are going to create the jobs that we now need, given where unemployment seems to have got to. Thank you very much. I've got a question from um, Keely about business rates relief. And then I'll come to Richard afterwards. Are there any plans to extend the business rate relief for hospitality businesses? past March 21. Yeah, this came up in the um, in the chamber uh, just last week. Um, the, the Chancellor's current position is he's not announced it, so at the minute it's not happening. Um, and he, his next big set piece will be the budget in um, February, March next year. Um, the economic circumstances will be, as I just said, gonna, it's going to be really difficult um, balance for him to strike. We know that rates um, are bringing a, an awful lot of money for the exchequer, but you know, as as you highlighted in the in the earlier question, there are sectors of the economy that have been astronomically hit by what's happened, um, and so I, I can't preempt what the chancellor will will do. But um, there are lots of us who are making the case, and you know a lot will also depend on where we get to over the next month or two. Um, but we, you know, what we can't be doing is hitting a sector when it's just about to get back on its feet. Mm. We will only be at a point of recovery yeah. by then, hopefully. And unless we're trading at full capacities with weddings, events, dinners, etc., there's just, you know, no possibility yeah. that the, that level of business rate can be paid. Yeah, yeah, you, yeah. You need business back to back to. 100% of you know demand where it where it was before and the kind of the variety of stuff that you did which presumably meant you were able to do things in summer winter autumn uh, you know you were always full and uh, that you know that's where businesses make the most money they you've got that that span unless you can do all of it then businesses curtailed to such a degree that 
everything becomes a, a huge pressure. So, yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. So, looking looking forward in terms of, of what the spending review hinted at and um, where we might be going next. With Richard, you've got a question about levelling up the north. I have. Um, good afternoon, Anthony. Nice to see you, sir. Um, I think I think it's on this lines. We, 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 we the levelling up agenda is broadly painted as how can we keep the north in touch with the south, or a variation on that. And I wonder if I'm, I'm, I'm more interested in this really. How does Lancashire create its own levelling up agenda within the north? And my context is, you know, the big voices come from Manchester and Liverpool. Uh, Manchester, I understand, but Liverpool as, it, as an economy, which is within about one or two percentage points of ours, mm. and Liverpool as an economy, uh, sorry, and population within about 50,000 of ours, thereabouts, um, you really wouldn't know it. And I wonder what we can do, Anthony, if it's through you, or th what, what is our way of making a bigger noise and levelling up Lancashire in the Northern debate? Yeah, I think it's a really good question, Richard, and... Um, it's um, it's a marketing problem as much as it is anything else, right? The Liverpool, Manchester, and it comes with being a city. You've got that brand that you can really push, uh, and and you see it elsewhere as well. Like you know, Birmingham, um, even cities like Stoke, you've got the brand that you can push. And actually, as as brand Lancashire, um, we've we've just never done a good job of it. You know, there's there's lots of Sometimes there's competing interests. And one of, one of the best things we've got in Lancashire, we've got a real diversity, right? We've got a, a, the second, I think second or third biggest aerospace cluster in the world, in the Northwest, huge part, fourth biggest, sorry, man, fourth biggest in the world. A huge part of that is um, centered in Lancashire. Um, but we've, you know, as we've just been here, we've got some fantastic hospitality businesses, um, We've got all of these things, and it's bringing everything together into one coherent brand, vision, marketing thing that when we go and knock on government's door, we've got something and we can say, this is where we are, this is where we want to get to. And cities do it really well. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm big on Anthony. Tr trust me, I'm, I'm all the way with you there. I love the idea about it being a marketing exercise. That's how I make my living through marketing. But is it a marketing exercise? What's the practical realization of our ambition and our ambition is to be recognized i think as a county in the same way that, that merseyside recognizes itself we've got such a disparate grouping of political and local authority leaderships at the same time this is what i'm trying to get to we, we did a really good job as a disparate county without a combined authority coming together to get money out of the government for lockdown version whatever it was tier tier three etc we did no worse than Merseyside and we did better than Manchester and we were all disparate. But I still, that doesn't really get to the point of how do we make our demands as a unit, as a group? I appreciate what you're saying about the diversity. That's the problem. What's the solution? So part of, I mean, part of the solution is down here in Westminster and how we as Lancashire MPs organise ourselves and, and push forward uh, our brand and um, party lines helps on this, right? With the vast majority sit on the same benches that I do, and that means we can walk into a meeting as a collective um, and do that. And you know, where we can do things cross party, we will because um, anything that helps Lancashire helps all of us. Um, you also see other groups popping up, so things like the Northern Research Group um, that, that that's made some uh, waves in the news it, to do exactly the same thing to actually make sure that. In Westminster, the bit that we can do, um, we do it with maximum punch, maximum effort, maximum input. Um, because if you put maximum input in and you've got strength in numbers, then you get the output um, from it as well. So some of it is a Westminster problem of just how we collectively work together. Um, you're right about the way local authorities um, across the county work, both um, both the county council and the diff different uh, boroughs and um, Sometimes they work really well together. Sometimes they don't work so well together. Uh, and, and I think, you know, where they don't work well together, that's when I would say, let's just move the focus onto something else. So if that means then coming to the Chamber of Commerce and going, look, there's some political difficulties in 
way local authorities are running uh, or, or are communicating this or there's a difference of opinion but actually um this still needs to happen anyway and you'll see when the chancellor announced the leveling up fund one of the things he said was that it had to command uh, local support but he didn't say uh, what kind of local support that would be so some of that is making sure the mp is supportive and involved um, same goes for the council but it doesn't have to be you know if you could find something that commanded the support of um, all the business groups or the chamber of commerce and a another then that's equally as powerful as saying, and this has got the support of uh, an individual uh, borough or the county council or the MP. Um, so I think what government is trying to do with that is unlock things and say there's no one partner that's a barrier to it, uh, which has been the problem historically. You know, one one group, one person has had the right of veto and actually said, if there's some good cross stakeholder support for any given project, bring it to us and we'll look at it um, with a view to to doing it, does that help? Yeah, it, 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 sorry. Yes, it, yeah, it does. I mean, it's 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 a it's, it's a it's a conundrum. I mean, we've been writing about it for since the day the first day we launched our magazine. Uh, but it, it does feel as though there are some structures becoming available. Can I just keep? Can I ask you just one more question? And um, it's not meant to be a journalism question, but it is. It's something that's been reflected to us from um, our lead interview in our next magazine. Can I just? It, and if this is the wrong forum, Anthony, just say so. Kickstart program. Yeah. Just, I'm looking at it now. I'm just pressing the Kickstart link on my screen. This is a business that thinks it's gonna, they're going to have to spend more than half a million pounds more than they were expecting to. And I'm literally kicking the government Kickstart program link on my computer, and it's dead. Now, my understanding is that there are tens of thousands of applications in for Kickstart, and the yeah. kickstart was boot was put in place to, to help support covid and my understanding is that the, it's not just the chambers make uk is another there are a number of gateways yeah. and between them nationally they have placed zero let me just add some some more weight to that before you before you have to field it anthony as well and again this is a really sorry this is coming to you but it is amazing yeah but, you, but you're here mate <laughs> I, I have right. done, you, you missed it richard i did do the bit about the fact uh, that anthony's here as our friend and our conduit yeah, sent messages rather than the person to beat with big sticks um but the, the kickstart program is a, is a major issue because obviously chambers amongst other organizations have have been um, urge to set themselves up yeah. as gateways to help businesses apply, which we've all done and there are many organisations. And the, the chambers collectively, nationally, have actually got over 68,000 applications for Amazing. jobs, for roles that have been offered by businesses. And that was a really early figure, so now it must be ridiculous. Um, and the problem is, the whole thing just hasn't been, been kicked off yet. The, the, there was no kind of structure behind it in terms of, of DWP, how they were going to deal with all of these, these things. This is Department of Work and Pensions, yeah. how they were how they were going to actually deal with those applications. So they've all just sat there and they're, they're trying to approve them in blocks and failing really quickly. And the businesses are losing heart. The businesses logged in and asked for these from September the 7th onwards. Mm -hmm. And the businesses are, are dropping away now. And it's a massive, it's, it's obviously it's a reputational thing for Chambers, which is, if you, I'll come to you in a sec, Mike, to add to that, thank you. Uh, it, it's a, you know, it's a reputational thing, but irregardless of that, all of these potential roles that have been put forward uh, and were there to, to help are, are just getting out of date and older and businesses can't wait. What were you going to add to that, Mike, before we, we um, um, ask Anthony to, to see what he can say to us about that? I was just going to add to it, I've got a letter from um, the Department of Work and Pensions that I wrote uh, to Jake Berry about and got a response last week on it, saying, uh, I, I was saying about the, the minimum 30 uh, people. Now, uh, I have got that response, said, well, you've got to go through the council, you've got to go through some intermediary organisation to uh, be involved with this scheme. And uh, quite frankly, uh, my experience of life is when you start adding intermediaries into these things, the extra cost, extra administration, extra hassle, extra bother. Why can't we just do it ourselves? Why is this minimum of 30? 
I can answer that bit. And that was just so that there weren't uh, millions of individual applications for ones and twos going in. And that was why the chambers and others were asked to stand as intermediaries, not taking any cost out of it, but just to be able to clump them together. So they were getting bulk applications through. But I'm sure Anthony can add some depth to that. But also it's how do we unlock this, this literally log jam of, of roles that are there to, to really help support the economy. And I, I was totally, I read this letter and I just thought, oh, I couldn't be bothered. And I'm the sort of person you will, I could take 10 on. Yeah. Go ahead, so, so I think you're right, Miranda. I mean, the reason was to try and um, to try and avoid this logjam that we now find ourselves in. In that, you know, the idea was if you limit the number of organisations that are applying to those that are um, either acting as a gateway or the ones who are taking on a, a significant number, then you can approve them far quicker. Uh, I didn't appreciate the scale of that problem, um, but I will. I'll, I'll take it up with um, with the DWP because. Uh, <laughs> Kickstart is aimed at those young people who are trying to get into the world of work for the first time, right? And and it's it's the key stage of life that you need people to be getting employed at that point because of the life skills it gives them, right? The the discipline it instills on going to work and and doing all of those things. So uh, if if we're saying the seventh of September, we're three months on from that, um, and so we're talking about a scheme that was, uh, you know, that's that's intended to help people in the here and now. Uh, presumably that won't actually kick into helping them until sometime in the new year. So um, let me pick that up and then I'll come back to you, Miranda, and then you can uh, filter it out if that's helpful. Thank you. No, thank you very much because we, we we can give you both ammunition, but also mm. um, feed out of, of anything that you, you, you managed to unlock for us on that front. Um, any other questions? We sort of hit every every topic once. <laughs> um, go on, Mike. Uh, you might have covered this. I do apologise. I was late to the meeting, um, but uh, the uh, I have a, a a sort of longer range concern about uh, the, the prime minister's fixation with um, his environmental targets, uh, which are all very fine, but I just don't see the practicality of his targets tying in to uh, you know, how they can actually be delivered and uh, delivered without increasing the cost of energy to businesses and indeed consumers massively. Uh, for example, electric cars will mean you'll for need four times as much cables in the street, four times bigger substations, uh, you know, uh, no matter what Boris says, 40 gigawatts of uh, wind power only gives you 16 gigawatts of power because the wind only blows a third of the time and they have to be down for maintenance. There seems to be some dodgy maths in, in all of this. And uh, I just, you know, a, a, a thought is that perhaps uh, there should be uh, some sort of evidence-based uh, centre for putting a bit of reality on some of this stuff because it all's quite pie in the sky, quite a lot of this. Yeah, it's a it, it's a fair point, mate. I think the way I would uh, look at it is, and, and you, you'll note that when the Prime Minister made his announcement, um, I don't think any car maker came out and said that it was unrealistic or unachievable because they're all moving that way anyway. So some of this, I think, is government throwing its weight and energy behind a change that's already happening. And actually, if it's going to happen anyway, we might as well start to plan for it. And as we're thinking about the infrastructure we need over the next 10, 15 and, and beyond horizon, actually, let's make sure it's capable for the future. So the reason that um, we're putting money into hydrogen technology, for example, is because we know that hydrogen is what will probably end up uh, powering freight because batteries and electric for a number of reasons just aren't that practical for, for heavy goods. Um, so it's about using that government investment to try and kickstart um, investment from the private sector um, and all of those things. And it was only two, three weeks ago, I'm looking at Miranda, that we run an Electricity Northwest uh, seminar talking about uh, exactly this and how we make sure that the energy grid is set up for the future so that you can do exactly that. And you know, at the minute, 
I think you can have two or three vehicle charging points on a street before you then have to go to the national grid and they have to start looking into whether they can actually facilitate it. And, and they're the kind of things that we need to unblock because, as you said, you know, if we're going to get to a position where uh, most people are, are driving electric vehicles, the grid, as it currently stands, just isn't set up for it. Um, or we need to change habits and get people charging at different times or in different places. Uh, and, you know, one of the benefits of electric is you don't have to go to a refueling station. So some people will charge at work. Some people will charge uh, in a service station. Some people will charge when they get home. Um, and so some of this is about using government investment and messaging and giving a clear sense of direction. Um, but you're right there. I mean, it's going to be challenging. Uh, you know, I think when the PM announced it, uh, the other month. He knew it was a, a stretching target, but one that puts us firmly on the side of it's happening anyway. So how can we make sure we're part of it and we get the jobs in this country that will facilitate it rather than, you know, essentially riding the wave and in 20 years time, finding that we're importing all of the things we need because another country got a head start on, on all of those investments. I, I think if you find if the energy costs in this country for industrial processes are greater than our competitors, uh, you will be importing lots of stuff, like we import cement and concrete blocks from the Netherlands now, because energy costs in this country are so more, much more expensive than the Netherlands, who don't pass on their uh, environmental costs, neither to the Germans, to industry. Um, just needs a bit of real thinking going into this, because it's all pie in the sky at the moment. And I'm concerned that you're going to make us uncompetitive by setting targets that no other country is even getting close to saying that they're going for. Uh, even the EU is miles behind. They can, they're nowhere near yeah. the targets that Boris is putting forward. Um, and, you know, we've got to be competitive in this world and we're not going to be. Yeah, no, I, I, I totally do take the point. Daniel, please. See, I wasn't prepared for that one then. Uh, <laughs> I, 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 I was just quickly looking at the list again. <laughs> Sorry, Neil. <laughs> uh, question for Anthony, I guess. You're kind of so used to uh, fielding questions at you. Uh, you know, throw it the other way around. What what, what, would, what can we do for you? What What's... If the local business community is on side and you've you know you've got some of us listening to you um you know what what do you want of us what can we do um that's a really good question now uh, it's not often i get a question <laughs> um I, so i found the conversations i've had with uh, miranda incredibly helpful about what the sentiment is what the challenges are and i guess my big ask would be keep feeding them in and feed them in really frequently because uh, the, the more understanding, you know, the, the better prepared I am going into any meeting. If I can say, I've got an update from my local businesses and it's not X number of months old, which is sometimes the challenge you've got in this. You, you can never have enough information in this job is what I'm uh, coming to realize. The more informed you are, then it means you walk into a meeting and you know exactly what you're asking for and you've got the information to back it up. And, and that's a really powerful tool when you go and sit with, the chancellor or the PM or um, or the chief secretary to the treasuries who are meeting later this week, if you can say, I've spoken to my businesses this week, these are the key challenges, these are the the infrastructure we need, we need unblocking, be it better broadband or actually this one road is the main problem or um, we're trying to get our lorries out and this junction itself is the problem. You know, I think sometimes I get such a macro view, whereas actually sometimes what you want is the micro view. What's, what's the quick wins that will just unblock some of the things that are causing an irritation or uh, or a delay does that make sense that it's you know macro is great and, and 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 i need that but you also want that micro view and so a lot of the conversations i have with a council are what is it that's happening on the micro level you know talk to me about individual business within a sector um, rather than just the sector uh, overall because that's the bit that you can have the quickest impact on on trying to fix yeah that's brilliant that's brilliant to hear and and thank you neil for asking that because that's normally my my entreaty at the end so it's great to hear it 
coming from 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 you as well. Um, just to just to wrap up, um, it's it's really excellent to have you here, Anthony. It's it's been sounding sounding very parochial, but it, it's been really excellent to see you get in the job and get, really get your teeth into it and stay open and accessible and available to us because quite often people land in the job and they sound you know, really really there for everybody and then you can see the sort of doors start to close as they, they, they the brain gets full and they stop listening and it's great that you are still there and, and available and accessible and willing to throw yourself into something like this which you know is, is it's never easy it's like skating on, on on thin ice while carrying a tea tray or something i don't know what it is but thank you very very much for being here just to just to, to to capture a few of the things that have been said, um, and then some of the things that the chamber's fielding, we are um, about to push out literally today the beginning of the the latest um, round of, of Brexit support, and that really is just about making sure everybody can reach um, the government advice um, uh, both electronically and in, in document form and also making sure that you're aware of local events you can come to, all publicly funded, all available for everybody. So that is there, as is the Brexit hub and also the coronavirus hub. If you have questions about support and want to um, for you, we will always do that. I seem to have got stuck, that's better, I've understood. Um, we're there to help try and get those opinions together and pass them on to Anthony and all his, his colleagues. If you're interested in, um, either participating or, or might face challenging the, the um, low carbon initiatives going on at the moment, making sure they really are what you need to see. And um, please feed into our chamber low carbon team because all that support is there and fully funded and there to make your business more profitable. And don't forget to come along to the fire safety event. What's, what date is that? Where's that gone, Simon? It's on chamber live, it says on chamber live. Next Wednesday okay. morning, Miranda. Wednesday, when, the, Wednesday 9th. the 9th, 9th Wednesday the 9th of December. Um, so come along and, and participate in that. But more than anything, um, it's the three line, three line mnemonic we've been using recently. Keep well, keep safe and keep in touch and keep trading in your businesses. Make sure you tell us what you need. Make sure you tell Anthony what you need. We'll all club together to try and represent your area of Lancashire uh, and keep your businesses going. And have a happy Christmas. Yeah. Thanks for watching this Chamber Live video from the East Lancashire Chamber of Commerce. If you've enjoyed this content, then you might enjoy some of the other content that's on the screen now. Please do subscribe to our YouTube channel.